bringing you key insights, tips, and advice from the brightest minds in the Canadian franchise industry. This is the Franchise Canada Chats podcast. I'm Angela Cote, your host of the Franchise Canada Chats podcast, where we take you into the world of franchising. Our interviews are with franchisees, franchisors, and industry leaders who give on the pulse expert advice and share their franchising insights and experiences. Hello, Angela Cote here, and I am excited to be here on behalf of the CFA to interview the man, the myth, and the legend, Frank Zaid, who is a retired franchise lawyer, but also using all of his amazing expertise that he acquired over the years to work with franchisors. Now, I'll let him explain that to you in just a minute. Um, just for a little bit of context here, my background is that I uh, come from the family business, m M&M Food Market. My dad, Mac, is the founder. And over the years, we grew to almost 500 locations. And I've said this before, but I have to say it again, that when I first started my current advising business, one of the first things I did was to join the CFA because my dad had always raved about the amazing education, the connections, and the support that we got at m M&M from being members of the CFA. So that is what makes me excited to be here today. I'm looking forward to digging in here and ensuring that we leave you with some great takeaways. So Frank, are you ready to get rolling? I'm always ready, especially privileged to speak with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I hopefully I will be called the legend like you someday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's get into. I think it's really cool that you know when when you first started out, but using the franchise model for growth was so much less common than it is nowadays. And I I even know that my dad with M M&M and M Food Market when back in 1980 when he decided to use the franchise model. Even then it was a little bit progressive because most of the businesses that were franchising were like quick service restaurants, you know, A&W, Dairy Queen and these types of restaurants. So I think it's really cool that you chose to specialize in franchise law. So do you mind first telling us a little bit about that? Like you were, you were practicing law, you chose this path. Uh, sure. Actually, I don't know if I chose it or if it fell into my lap. I was a chemical engineer graduate, didn't know what to do, and heard about intellectual property law, because you had to have science background or engineering background. So I went into law school, thinking I was going to be an IP lawyer. I joined a small uh, boutique IP firm for my articling year, and found out that I love parts of IP, like trademarks and copyright, but I also really couldn't stand the technical stuff like patents and industrial design. So I was very fortunate after I articled to uh, be asked to join a major law firm in Toronto, uh, where I was just a young corporate commercial lawyer. Uh, But they wanted me also to take care of the IP work that might come into the firm. So I'd say, oh, maybe two, three years down the road after being the third young lawyer on some big bond financing deals where I never saw clients or got to meet them. Coincidentally, there were two franchisors in the automotive uh, aftermarket service business who were referred to the firm and the partners who got these referrals threw up their hands and say, I don't know anything about franchising. Zaid, you take care of this stuff because there are trademarks involved. So I started realizing that this was a, an empty field. There were like, honestly, three or four lawyers in all of the country who were, who were dealing with franchising. Uh, there were no laws. There was really an open market. And I had to learn a lot. So I set out to learn a lot about franchising that I could and to help these two franchisors come to Canada. And then I said, you know, this is a lot of fun. I'm dealing with entrepreneurs. I'm dealing with owners. And not only that, as a young lawyer in a big firm, I've got direct contact with these people. So I decided I would explore a bit, learned that there was uh, the Canadian Franchise Association. In those days, it was called the Association of Canadian Franchisors. Mm. And they had an annual law day, uh, which I went to. uh, And I went to the law day and I found out that the law firm that was counsel to the ACF, as we called it, had seven lawyers 
And one guest on the Law Day program, I said, hey, this is kind of interesting. There's nobody else. <laughs> so uh, long story short, I started promoting. I started going to the U.S. to the IFA conferences. I started getting involved in the CFA. And um, I guess my real start was when I convinced a conference company in Canada to have a conference on franchising in Canada. And we got 125 people in the uh, mid 70s to come. And uh, I walked away with five clients, mainly from the US. And that ever since then, it's just been, uh, I love this field, I'm going to help see it grow and uh, not be shy. You can't be shy if you're a franchise service supplier and met people and just built up one of the best practice, biggest practices in franchising in the country. While I was in practice, I worked with over 400 franchise systems. I was on the board of directors of a number of uh, my franchise clients. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the, uh, the recognition and awards. And now, uh, since I retired almost close to 10 years ago, I've been involved as a franchise mediator and arbitrator with ADR Chambers. I'm the only mediator and arbitrator in Canada whose practice is restricted to franchise disputes exclusively. I'd like to sit on more franchise or advisory boards or board of directors. I was involved and still am involved in some franchise business consulting. I'm uh, available to uh, act as a franchise system ombudsman and I do expert witness work uh, when I'm retained uh, on a franchise disputes and an expert is uh, needed. So that is my short, almost 45 years. That's amazing. I, I can't resist just jumping in on how yeah. I can relate in a way. I mean, I'm not going to try to pretend I have the level and depth of experience that you have, but I can relate in that you know, you, you were going through all these things sort of organically, it was just happening. And you were you were learning and, and getting better at what you did and, and wanted to then use that now to 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 work with people and, and, and share what you learn. And, and when you mentioned that, you were like, hey, these are business owners. And I remember it just I just had a flashback when you said that. I remember back in I think it was 2016, when I went to my first CFA conference as a, as a now advisor for franchise companies. I was, you know, very green with my business card. I'm a franchise consultant. I'm here to help you with all the things I learned, you know, growing up with M&M. I remember being in that room at the CFA national convention, and there were all these, you know, entrepreneurs, these franchisors who were providing opportunity to other people to be small business owner entrepreneurs all people with a can-do attitude. And I just thought this is, this is really a neat industry to be in this, that, that, you know, that can-do attitude and these entrepreneurs. So I, I think that's really cool that you, it sounds like you maybe went through that a little bit yourself early on. Well, I've got to tell you, there's no industry that I've ever been involved with uh, where people are so generous with their time and their assistance. It really yeah. is an amazing industry. And uh, I learned an awful lot from some of the earlier, the few franchise lawyers uh, that were practicing. They didn't mind that I was the up and coming competition and always have learned, certainly all my involvement with franchisors and being on advisory boards uh, and, and mediating and arbitrating. I continue to learn. There's no end to the amount of learning you can get. And my mission really these days, apart from the business I'm doing, is to give back to the community. I've had a wonderful career in law. I've had a great part-time career in the other things I'm doing. I've got friends all over the world that I've met in franchising. And uh, I want to see the industry continue and give back to some of the younger people if I can. <clears throat> That's fantastic. And yeah, I, I agree that, you know, when I, again, back to that, that first conference and then multiple conferences after both the CFA and, and others uh, in the U S I, I kept seeing this as well, this, this collaboration that people wanted to help each other and you'd see competitive competitors, franchisors, even helping each other and learning yes. from each other. It's, it's really interesting. Um, well, we're, like we're, we're all interested in ethical franchising and that's what the CFA is all about. And I've seen plenty of unethical franchising and I want to root that out. And I want people to go into franchising with the right attitude and uh, the right spirit. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Whether, whether franchisor or franchisee, I, I agree with you that, you know, the franchisor has to do it for the right reasons and have the right DNA and the right, you know, the right ethics about it. And then as a franchisee, you want to go in with clarity on, on, you know, what you're trying to do and, um, and understand, you know, and this is the thing that about franchising that you and I both know very well is that it really comes down to relationships and, um, that's one thing that I think a lot of people don't understand. And, and if you, as a prospective franchisee, understanding that, you know, your, your franchisor, they're, they're there to look out for you. And if done properly, it can be a really, really good business opportunity. So, okay. I I'm kind of torn between moving to uh, moving on to what you do now and talking still about some of the cool things you've learned. I'm going to go with, let's just go a little deeper on what you currently do now, just to clarify for people. And then we're going to sure. go back to, um, you know, things that you've learned over the years, because there's a lot, a lot of meat there. <laughs> so no so, pun intended <laughs> meat. I, I never expected, but I started getting a number of calls from emerging or startup franchisors about how can you help me? So I was involved, and I still am to a lesser degree involved in franchise business consulting. I'm not a practicing lawyer. I don't do legal work anymore, but I certainly can help franchisors frame what they might have to do and how to get the right advisors in different uh, disciplines and uh, work with those people to make sure that things are being properly covered and quite frankly, to cut down on the costs that often occur when a, a startup franchisor uh, is working with different consultants because there's a lot of stuff that the consultants feel obligated to explain even though they know that it's not going to apply to that particular system. So that's one. The other one, as I said, is, uh, and I think many of the franchise lawyers know this, I uh, do I'm retained to mediate or, or arbitrate franchise disputes. And uh, the reason I'm retained is that, yes, I have the legal background, but I also have a tremendous business background and experience in franchising. And I can step into a dispute and it doesn't take me very long to understand what the issues are. You don't have to explain to me what an advertising fund is. You don't have to explain to me that there are issues about uh, cannibalization or that there are breaches that haven't been corrected. I know, I know that. So I get into the business situation because all disputes revolve around a business issue as well as a legal issue. And my job is to try to get the parties together to understand their cases. And I have had, fortunately, quite a high success rate of, of getting the parties to settle their disputes and walk away without having to spend a lot of time and money uh, going to court. And that's in the most mediations are only one day. So I love doing that. And uh, arbitration, of course, is a, is a more complex situation. I do arbitrate disputes when they can't be settled and rather than going to court. Uh, an arbitration, if it's handled properly, can be much quicker. It should be less expensive and it's private and confidential. And I think that's the important thing that people should know. An arbitrated decision is private and confidential and will not be known to the general public. We know in franchising over the years, some of the big disputes that have had enormous publicity and adverse publicity on the front pages. You can avoid that with arbitration of a dispute. Last thing is, is, as I said, is sitting on, I think I said, sitting on advisory boards of franchisors. I'm always welcome to entertain a, an opportunity to do that. And uh, the expert witness work is pure, is, is legal. I get retained as an expert witness to talk about what are the common practices in franchising? Uh, what are, what does some provision in a franchise agreement really mean, those types of things. And those actually uh, have been very fortunate. Some of those are international disputes and, and very, very interesting. I might say I like that. I love that work because I actually get some respect from, from the panel as opposed right. to getting cross-examined all the time. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's let's talk a little bit now about some of the highlights or, or just Franchise companies you've worked with over the years where you learned the most. I know you've worked with a lot of uh, companies, bigger companies. So let's talk about a few of those. Yeah, well, I'll, I don't, I'll throw out some names and then I'll, I'll zero in, in on uh, some of the ones where I, I really learned a lot and had experience that I could perhaps pass on to other people. And I don't mean to exclude anybody. It's just because, as I said, I work with 400 systems, but in each of these cases, there was something special that I about how they ran their businesses, 
and uh, what I learned. So I'm just going to throw out our names and then I'll come circle back to the ones that I want to spend a couple of minutes on. Uh, Choice Hotels Canada, Subway Franchise Systems, a uh, company you've identified, M &M, well, it was at, then M&M &M Meat Shops mm -hmm. until it was sold and got changed to M&M &M Meat Market, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, Tim Hortons, General Motors. Uh, these are all prominent franchisors. That's not to say that I haven't and, and I don't welcome working with much smaller and startup and emerging franchisors. And the last one, I'm going to say a few remarks because people always recognize me exclusively as having had franchise or experience. Well, I, I actually invested and was a part owner in some franchisee operations. And, and I did some work uh, for large franchise e associations. Oh. And the one that I want to make a few remarks about is the Canadian Midas Dealers Association. Actually, you could prob most of these companies that I've mentioned have been involved, other than Choice Hotels, have been involved in major franchise litigation. And maybe that's where I learned a lot. So let me just go back to Choice Hotels Canada. Uh, I acted for Choice Hotels International for many years. They only had a representative in Canada. Well, for people who don't know Choice, it's the largest hotel chain in Canada by number of um, uh, locations. Comfort in, quality, ascend, sleep in. Those are a few of the, the names. It's a mid-market chain. Um, so I was doing some work helping them from the United States when they had their representative in Canada uh, locate a lead for a franchise. There wasn't much going on. Then probably 26 years ago, Journey's End, which was another hotel chain that was sort of for the traveler, the overnight traveler, salesperson, or small family. They got contacted by Choice International. They decided to merge the two operations, and they formed Choice Hotels Canada, which to this day still exists. There are uh, successors to the Journey's End side, but Choice Hotels International is still a 50% partner, and it's a deadlock company. Very interesting. People will tell you never get into a deadlock joint venture, but it has been very successful, and I've been on the board. The thing I've learned uh, from Choice uh, with over 25 years' experience on the board is best practices amongst the best of dealing with franchisees and establishing franchise relationships that are meaningful apart from all the technical things they've done to make it a, uh, a well-organized franchise system. And I've really learned a lot of this in the last couple of years uh, with COVID. You can all imagine the decimation of the travel industry and the ho small hotel industry in the last few years. And these are, by and large, small business people, a lot of uh, immigrants, uh, to Canada who have bought a hotel or, or, or a couple of hotels. They have mortgages, they have operational costs, and they've been decimated with no business. Choice has just worked with the franchisee advisory board, held webinars, held meetings, given out material, kept the franchisees fully advised on all the government grants and other opportunities worked with industry associations like the hotel industry to lobby the government. And there have been no lawsuits. There has been incredible uh, enthusiasm amongst the franchisees to try to help the whole industry get out of this situation. And top management are, steps up and works with the franchisees. This is not delegated. Uh, to uh, field managers. And I just say that for franchisors, at the appropriate time, form, an, form a franchise advisory board or council, do it right, and be absolutely committed to it. Have the franchisees represented, have them involved, make sure that you're not playing a game where they have no say in anything that goes on, or forward thinking. If you don't respect the franchisees, through an advisory board or some other means, you're only inviting trouble. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. Did you know that Franchise Canada has a newsletter sent twice a month that's packed full of fresh franchise opportunities? With Franchise Canada e-news, you get new content from Franchise Canada magazine, franchisee success stories, industry news about CFA members, 
educational videos all about franchising, and you can keep up to date on the newest episodes of the Franchise Canada Chats podcast that you're listening to right now. Plus, by subscribing to Franchise Canada e-news, you get a free subscription to Franchise Canada magazine. Subscribe now at FranchiseCanada.online. Now, back to the podcast episode you are enjoying. And I'm just, so that's I'm gonna just jump in and this is yeah. yeah this is such a key thing that you're talking about here the importance of doing a fr- franchise advisory council right um can you 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 did just say you know make sure you actually give them a voice um because I've seen this as well where people use their advisory council their franchise advisory council to to tell them what they're going to do and say, well, we ran it by them. Well, did you really though? So is there anything that you can specifically speak to that you've seen people do wrong that, that they, and how can they do it different? You have to structure the board properly so that if it's a large franchise system, there is representation throughout the country by franchisees. You have to have the franchise or representatives on the advisory board in a position where they have authority and they have direct link to the CEO or some other important person. And the representatives, the franchisee representatives, in my view, must be elected by their peers. They're not, they should not be appointed by the franchisor. Yeah. And the franchisor representative, uh, I saw one large franchise system who had a, uh, the franchise had one major franchisor representative uh, whose job only was was franchise being on that board and i don't think that's a good thing because there are too many issues that get raised uh, through the advisory board that go into other major components of management of the franchise or so there have to be representatives and they but the most important thing is there has to be buy-in if top management and the owners don't buy into the franchise the advisory board and just use it as a means of, of throwing out. It's not just for throwing out things that are going to be uh, implemented uh, where the franchisees have no decision because it's too late. It's for getting new ideas. Yeah, I mean, they're wasting their opportunity if, they, yeah. if you don't. Uh, my dad always used the phrase leverage the collective wisdom of the franchisees, right. the, the franchisees on the front line. I, I see this all the time too, Frank, where franchisors are almost afraid to, to hear from their franchisees because, oh, you know, they, they're just, they have too many ideas, you know, or they, well, you know, it's like herding cats. It's like, yeah, but they're the ones with the great ideas. And so have a system in place and a framework for being able to listen to them from the franchise advisory council representative all the way through to the front line, even employees. So that they well, can- let me, let me move on to uh, um, a subway sure. subway in the U S we don't know. Everybody knows subway. And I got a call from Fred DeLuca, the then owner of subway many years ago. And founder, correct. Founder. founder yes. yep. Yep. Well, that's another interesting story that perhaps we can talk about at another time, how he founded it and how he, turned a 50% ownership of his yeah. co-investor into a, a, a gazillion dollars worth of, uh, yeah. of equity. Uh, so Fred called me and said, we're thinking of coming to Canada. I've seen you at the IFA. Can you come down to Milford, Connecticut and meet with me? So I flew down there and uh, met with him and some other people. And we talked about what, what they had in mind and how I might be able to help them. And they retained me. Um, and I said to Fred, you know, yeah, you're known in Canada because people have seen ads or their people be in the United States. But, you know, without mentioning names, we got some pretty strong uh, competitors in this business already homegrown he says, I don't care who's in the business. I know my system and they will be if they have 2000 locations in two years, we'll have 3000 locations. And. The, the organization of that company is something that was phenomenal, how different people that were working in different areas and, and fully, fully involved in learning and growing. And uh, the thing that I found incredibly fascinating about Subway is how they took a fairly con- conventional idea of having a bricks and mortar, fast service takeout with a limited seating, I would call it a restaurant if you like, how they took that and turned it into hundreds 
if not thousands, of different types of locations, train stations, hotels, hospitals, airports, schools, universities. And these were all incredibly great ways to grow the franchise. So my lesson there is don't be blindsided or don't only think that if you have a good franchise system, you can't grow it in other ways because the world is changing. And we certainly know that today and the phenomenal growth. And then the other thing is how he grew that system internationally to be in so many foreign countries where customs, language, religion, uh, laws are so different and yet be tremendously successful. It takes, I guess the other lesson is don't run before you understand what you're doing. You know, when you go into these different locations and you go into different countries, you have to understand and be and be advised. I can't say, how, and this is not just because I was an advisor. If you don't get good advice in all these different areas, and if you're not willing to pay for good advice, yeah. you're going to fail somewhere because yeah. we have an awful lot of different areas that go into franchising today. And I'm not just talking legal. I mean, with the work that you do uh, as, as a, an experienced business advisor, all of this stuff is important. And uh, when you grow and real estate location, I, we can go on forever, the different yeah. facets, but that's the lesson for, for Subway. Yeah. That, like, yeah, there, yeah, there were a few lessons in there and, and yeah, the, the, idea of getting advising that can fast track you or avoid expensive. You said it early on and, and it rang true for me. Cause I say the same thing. Like, you know, if you, you, and you talked about, you know, hiring somebody to help you so that you, you know, you actually save time, energy, and money because you, you avoid those expensive mistakes that you could have made. It's really, it's protecting you on the front end. Um, but that's a, yeah, that's a really cool story about Subway and, you know, I think there's something like 25 or more thousand units all over the world oh. now. So they must be doing can't, something right. <laughs> can't, can't keep track. Now, the other thing they do do, which a lot of people criticize, and they've had adverse publicity, but you can take this or leave this, is they do not allow defaulting franchisees to continue. If somebody is defaulting or not paying or, or and most importantly, going off menu or sourcing food products from other sources, uh, they're, gonna, they're going to enforce that agreement. And too many franchisors uh, have sympathy. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but you're in business. If you are going to feel sorry for your franchisees who are not going to be honest with you, you're only inviting further problems because other franchises are going to say, why should I comply if you're allowing A, B, or C not to? I it's still a business. Yeah. Well, when, when franchisors say, you know, oh, like, you know, they did, they, you know, um, they did this thing that it's really, it's sort of innocent. I'm not sure if I should do something about it. I'm like, well, are you wanting to set that standard that it's okay to not follow the brand standards? And so it's your, and then I say, remember you're, you have to protect everybody's investment. You have to be able to sleep at night, knowing that you as the franchisor, that's, that's what you're trying to do by holding them compliant. So if they understand that, then, then they won't see it as, you know, a negative repercussion, but rather that you're looking out for them. So, yeah, I agree with that. You um, know, that, let me, that, let me take the, that, that point uh, to talk about your father's company, M&M Meat Shops. And the thing I learned about, learned from your father and other management at M&M Meat Shops after they asked me to go on the board, and I was on the board probably about eight or 10 years until the company was sold. Now, this is a privately owned company. Uh, very local in Kitchener, Waterloo, where it started. And um, almost all the management was local. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, many locations and across the country. Um, but the tremendous enthusiasm that your father and management had for the concept and for the franchisees and the support they gave to the franchisees was um, was a great learning experience. Um, but in terms of um, sticking to the the model and the concept, now this may be a bit outdated today, but it's if it's outdated, there's another aspect that would apply. Um, 
the main method of promoting and advertising was flyers. Yeah. Flyers dropped off at, at locations and doing the research on the, uh, the particular areas and the socioeconomic population and uh, the benefit of flyers and promoting the, the, the stores and uh, sales and specials and whatnot was well, so there were some franchisees who didn't like flyers and they said, this is a waste of money. You know, people get them on their doorstep and they throw them in the garbage. I don't want to contribute to the flyers. Well, who's the expert here? And the company, you know, did its, deal, its, its uh, research, tracked the business that came from flyers versus the cost and would not tolerate stepping away. This is an advertising program. And we see too much of this today where there's an advertising program that the franchisors uh, have, have uh, developed and franchisees don't want to comply, particularly social media. And franchisees that step out of line with advertising are doing the brand a great deal of disservice and damage. And so I guess the lesson is um, stick to what you believe is right, but you can listen to the franchisees too on the advisory board about how they feel about advertising, but they don't make the advertising decisions. That's yeah. where the buck stops. Well, and the other thing too that I just want to get in here because we're going to run out of time because you and I can talk for hours. <laughs> um, I love the way that M&M &M Meat Shop stressed the importance of franchisees being involved in their local communities. The charity barbecue days, uh, working with the local store owners. Uh, that's so important because if you're not known in your community, uh, why are you trying to get business from the local community? If you're not giving back to the local community, to their charities or to their hospitals or whatever you can afford, you're missing a great opportunity to get new business. Oh, I love that you brought that up, Frank. I talk about this all the time to this day. You've probably heard me uh, talk about how I had to dress up as Kelly Kebab as a kid at grand opening. <laughs> But um, um, as a franchisee, you know, I had my own stores for 18 years in Victoria yeah. on Vancouver Island. And, you know, even though I, I opened store number 300, 319 and 327 in the chain. And even though by that point we were no a known brand and some people say an iconic Canadian brand, we couldn't just sit in our store and, and wait for business to come in. Now the flyers, you're, you're bang on there. Those were huge. And, and now it's e-flyers and various different other methods and social media. But, but the point about um, following that system, if the franchisor has it figured out is so true on the advertising front, but then combining that with community marketing. Um, I, I, I actually have, I've created a podcast where I talk about um, like one of my episodes is about who is responsible for marketing the franchisee or the franchisor. Well, it's both because why would you, I often say to people when they're thinking of franchising their business, I'm like, do you need local owners? Cause if you don't need local owners to run it, you might as well just get managers and keep it as a corporate company. But if you, if there's a value in having local people with boots on the ground that can go out and, and like you say, it's giving back, but it's also exposure for the business. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the experiences I had with M and M, which is also another lesson, not to denigrate the uh, M and M and the success it had, but when I got a phone call, M and M was in business. They already had twenty five or thirty locations, and I got a phone call from someone on the management team saying, uh, "We know you do franchise law. Uh, we think we have a problem." And I said, what's that? And they said, well, we've been using a very reputable law firm, but our franchise agreement is silent on advertising. Mm. There was nothing in the agreement for to, right. about advertising and an advertising fund. And there, that goes to my, my uh, lesson about make sure you retain people who know what they're doing and have experience. Mm -hmm. so I work with your uh, father and management team to find a way to be able to get the franchisees to buy in to uh, an advertising program and contributing to it when they weren't obligated to do that. Yeah. And, and we went, you know, we had to, we had to support them and had to experiment. And eventually when we could show that it was worthwhile, they agreed to an amendment to their agree, their franchise agreement. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to show results. That usually helps franchisees uh, with the buy-in, right? Yeah, so yeah. We, have, we have so many things we, we want to talk about here. We've got <laughs> about 10 minutes left. If it's okay with you, what I'm going to do is move us into, um, can you share what are a couple of the major changes you've seen in franchising over the years? Just one or two of those, and then I've got a couple other questions. Sure. Well, the major changes in franchising, and I'm just going to have sort of bullet point topics that you, they'll be self-evident when I say The diversity of franchisors and franchisees in culture, in ownership, uh, the diversity of new product and service categories, the um, growth of uh, franchise service suppliers, the specialization of so many people in the service areas that have committed to understand franchising, Um, the industry support from the CFA, Uh, The lobbying efforts of uh, industry associations like the CFA and the IFA, the whole community of franchising internationally, the International Franchise Association, the Canadian Franchise Association, the legal organizations like the American Bar Association and the Ontario Bar Association, big, big, big top of the list, technology, technology like the world and other businesses, technology is such an important part of franchising today in so many ways. Uh, Social media. And I guess the other one, because of my experience, I unfortunately have to say is franchise disputes and franchise lawsuits, which is another topic with proper understanding of franchise relations, early dispute resolution, and other means can really be cut down. But unfortunately, for a whole bunch of reasons, the tough, oh, the other, of course, is the very, very uh, high uh, amount of legislation involving franchising today. So there are a lot of franchise disputes which uh, get publicized and can be resolved with uh, a good business approach to them. Yeah, wow, that you're right. Those are a lot of uh, changes that that have happened. And when you say um, diversity of the serve uh, or of the models in business, um, you know, it seems to me that you know you, you can almost franchise any type of business if it's got the if it's got a profitable model and uh, the person franchising has the right DNA and the capital and and all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, is there are there any businesses that come to mind for you that are that are, are really unique and dynamic that you would never have expected to see franchising? Can you think of any examples? I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here. Well, you know what one of the biggest industries today in franchising is in terms of volume of business and profitability? It's the pet industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, who would have said that? <laughs> you wouldn't have expected and that, more yeah. So, and more so today than ever because of what we've been going through with uh with yeah. COVID and people staying at home. Uh, the home bad. service, oh, years ago when I got involved, there were no home service franchises. It was all brick yeah. and mortar. Come to my yeah. store and buy my product or service. Well, now home service in yeah, a gazillion cleaning, different Window categories. cleaning. Uh, everything. Yeah, everything outside, inside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I saw uh, across the street the other day, I saw somebody getting a uh, uh, his winter tie. Well, it was a few months ago getting a, his car um, all polished up and cleaned and uh, putting new tires on from At a company. Outside. So that's a huge, huge uh, new area. And um, take out food. Um, but some of the other, it's predominantly in the service area where I think there's been so much, but, but also spas, uh, personal care, el- elder care, it's yes, been a absolutely. huge, huge new area and yeah. profitable and growing. Yeah. So it's not just uh, quick service restaurants like A&W. Oh. And <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, now they, okay. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Uh, we've just got a couple minutes left here, but I, I do kind of want to talk about the CFA a little bit here because sure. you, you already have mentioned, you know, how much um, involvement you've had. Um Actually, well, let's let's hear about one of the uh, awards that you've received from the CFA that you're most proud of and, and why. And, and I, I'm bringing this up because I want people to know that the CFA recognizes, you know, excellence in franchising. And I think that's really important because it gives that level of credibility for when people are, 
you know, exploring who to trust and who to work with in franchising. So let's. Well, I, uh, probably the old, the, the oldest or lo- most longstanding member of the CFA in a combination from my f- former firm and my own business. Um, and I've, I've been involved in many, many capacities as general counsel, special counsel, chair of committees. I'm all still on committees. And this is all part of giving back. Um, But I was very honored in 2009 to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award. And I'm going to to show it to you. Yeah, for people that are are seeing this. Oh, there we go. I I believe my dad received that award when you Well, I'm going to uh, to get to that. So this this award is presented to an individual who has achieved excellence throughout their career in franchising. So I just only, figured out my new goal, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was the first, I was the first recipient. There was a posthumous award before, but I was the first living recipient to receive this. And it was total surprise to me. But as more of these awards, there's only one award, a lifetime achievement award a year, if they award it. And I'm very pleased to be in the company of people like George Cohan of McDonald's restaurants, Mac Voisin, M&M Eat Shops. These are all founders. Cora Sufildu, Cora's Breakfast, Jim Treliving of Boston Pizza. This is not an award that I can ever take lightly. And every time I think about it, I say, this is really probably the ultimate achievement. Uh, recognition. This is pure recognition from the industry that mm-hmm. I just can't thank the industry so more than I always have meant in mentioning it. That's fantastic. Congratulations. I know that was back in 2009, but that is a really exciting uh, recognition and, and I can see why you don't take it lightly. I'm sure that if you're ever having a bad day, just go pull that out <laughs> and remember, <laughs> remember your awesomeness and your superpowers. Um, what do you see as uh, uh, one or two of the biggest accomplishments by the CFA that, you know, why does the, why does the CFA matter so much? The CFA matters because this is an unregulated industry. It's regulated by law but it's not regulated as an industry per se. And you have so many laws that, especially now with six provinces having franchise statutes, uh, franchising historically had a very bad name. Uh, And that's probably in Canada had a bad name because the first province to have a franchise law was Alberta in the early eighties when a bunch of California franchisors came up and shafted a innocent franchisees out west. So how do we, how does the community protect itself? It can only protect itself through collective action. And that's what the CFA is and it's national. So you have advocacy, uh, you have, um, uh, the the question was, what is the CFA doing for everybody? Yeah. Yeah, so the education and programs are fabulous. Uh, membership growth has been terrific. It's a national organization. Uh, it has a code of ethics that uh, only allows ethical franchisors to be in the association. Um, it has leadership, which is incredible. I just mentioned some of the former leaders. Uh, but the key thing is to encourage, uh, is to have roots on the ground, to have the boots on the ground, knowing who the federal provincial, local, and municipal politicians are that have an interest in this because their interest uh, from a voting perspective is franchisees, not the franchisor. They get a lot more votes from a system that has 2,000 franchisees than a franchise owner. And so we have to, be, we have to educate these people. They have to understand what, the, what franchising is. They have to understand the the value to the uh, country's economy, the number of jobs, the number of uh, secondary suppliers. And so the CFA does a fantastic job in doing this with the annual meetings, with the publications, with the statistic gathering. And uh, there's nobody else. There are, some in, there are some other trade associations that when necessary, the CFA can partner with. Uh, like I know from my involvement with Choice Hotels, the Canadian Hotel Association, has stressed the ownership, the franchise ownership of of hotels when they're meeting with government officials to get uh, relief. And the CFA can partner with those different organizations, travel, hotels, food uh, food and beverage, restaurant associations. So I really, 
I don't, I don't think I'm being outspoken because I'm sure you would agree with me. Percent. I really, really take offense at franchise companies, especially the ones that can afford it, of not being members of this association because they get the benefit. You know what? I, that's interesting you say that because I've had people ask me why I become a member of the CFA. And I, I say all the things you just said. And I say, but if none of that's even something you think you need, you should be a member just to support the awesome work that they're doing to protect the model and to protect you. So it's not, it might not feel direct, but they are doing a lot for us. For us yeah, all. I mean, we're, we have our own businesses that we're interested in, but we're also out there spending tons and tons of time to benefit the community. And yeah. if they don't, you know, they should support that work. Absolutely. Well, big shout out to the CFA, obviously from us here. Yeah. I think we've got to wrap it up here. I, I feel like, it, like you said, we could probably talk all day. Um, but Frank, before we hop off, let's just make sure that people know where to find you. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they're listening and thinking, man, I got to meet the legend. <laughs> well, I have my own website, frankzade.com or frankzade.ca. Z-A-I-D is how you, spell, yes. how you spell it. Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn. Just Google my name and LinkedIn. My email address is fzade at frankzade.com. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I'm sure you'll get some people reaching out to you. Well, I hope so. And I want to say, please, anybody who wants to talk to me, I'm not a lawyer anymore. I don't need to uh, chart, put the clock on. (laughs) Uh, I'm happy to help. And eventually, if you know, if there's something that we can do together, whoever it is, uh, we'll work on an arrangement. Yeah. Start with an exploratory call. It's yeah. very clear that you, you giving back is really important to you and, and doing the right thing in franchising. So that comes through very clear. Thank you so much, Frank. And I look forward to seeing you at the next in-person franchise conference, maybe the CFA in the spring. Okay. The drinks on me. Sweet. Thank you. <laughs> It'll be awesome. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more franchising resources, including how-to articles, expert advice, franchisee success stories, and franchise opportunities, visit FranchiseCanada.online. Don't forget to subscribe to Franchise Canada e-news while you're there. You can also learn more about franchising at CFA.ca and connect with specific franchise opportunities at lookforafranchise.ca. Now go be awesome.